Hey guys, um, so we'll probably wait just a couple more minutes before getting started. Um, I know that there's at least one thing that I've actually discovered feature-wise that should be able to help some of you guys out in terms of making sure sketches are defined, so hopefully that will be uh, beneficial for the future and making sure that um, <coughs> don't have any underdefined sketches. Uh, and also we'll be talking about some couple more features today, so shouldn't really be too long of a lecture. Um, so hopefully there should be a good amount of time to uh, devoted to uh, working on the uh, assignments. And also, I think we'll just kind of do what we did last time, which is primarily just uh, I will stream SolidWorks, um, and hopefully you guys can just kind of follow along with the PowerPoint if you so choose. If not, the PowerPoint is going to be recorded, so you'll still be able to kind of see where my thought process is going with regard to like the PowerPoint itself uh, if you're watching the video. but. If not, then that's totally fine. <clears throat> we do have a homework assignment due tonight. So hopefully everyone has been able to get that done. If anybody has any questions about that homework assignment. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, if anybody does have any questions about that homework assignment, then... Uh, we can talk about it kind of near the end of the lecture when we have time between uh, finishing up with the lecture and working on the uh, in-class assignment. <clears throat> um, okay, so I'll, I'll go through this part kind of near the end again, uh, just for anybody who is dropping in. Um, but for right now, or at least to start off, um, I want to go into kind of defining sketches. So the one thing that I've noticed with a lot of you guys, or at least a handful of you guys, is that um, you're you're perfectly fine with being able to like smart dimension all of the different parts of your sketches. Um, however, there might still be moments where uh, the sketch is actually still underdefined, um, and we might be scratching our heads and thinking, well, what the heck? Why is I mean, I dimensioned everything. Why am I still getting the issue of uh, of trying to make sure that my my sketch is is underdefined? Um, so usually that is in relation to some sort of uh, some sort of dimension in relation to the origin. Uh, typically, even though we might have <clears throat> our sketch defined, like if we're if you're looking at the PowerPoint, if not, we just have a rectangle and we might define both the length and the width of this rectangle. However, it's still giving us that it's underdefined. And the reason for that is because it's not, or rather it doesn't have any sort of reference to the origin quite yet. So the way that we can solve this, one of our methods is to define it in terms of the origin. So we can just select either any side or vertex and then say, well, it may be in the X direction, it's 0.9 units away from the origin and, the, and in the Y direction, it's 0.3 units away. So just making sure that not only are all of our sides or edges or arcs defined, but also making sure that those things are defined with regard to the origin as well. Um, and that extends to even more complex sketches as well. So if we have, uh, say, if you're thinking about the, uh, I believe it was the demo example, or maybe not the demo, but the, uh, the, the, the button example, where we might still have some arcs where they are actually not completely defined, even though everything has been assigned a dimension. So a way that we can actually adjust for that is we actually have a tool for that. Um, and it's within the sketch menu. I actually just found out about this when I was kind of looking into uh, some ways to define 
uh, sketches easier or to make sure that everything is fully defined. So if you're looking at Discord, let me pull up SolidWorks. I'm just going to start making a sketch. I'm going to draw on the right plane here. <clears throat> and I'm not even going to start at the origin. I'm just going to basically just start kind of making whatever the heck kind of geometry I want. I might create something that's kind of similar to that button example that we had. Maybe something that's similar but not entirely the same. So I'll say that it kind of looks maybe something like this. Then I'll just trim away any of the weird edges that we don't really want. So I'll define this as, let's say, just 50 millimeters. And then I'll assign my arcs as well. So I might say that this is like eight and a half. And I'll even maybe assign a couple of relations as well. So I can say that these two things are tangent to each other. Same thing with these two arcs here, make them tangent to each other. And then even now we can still see, well, hey, none of these things are actually fully defined quite yet, um, even though I am assigning some dimensions here and there to everything. And that kind of harkens back to what I was just saying. Even though I'm assigning dimensions and making sure that all these things do have dimensions or have some sort of radius or length to them, it doesn't actually have any relation to the origin, which means that it's not going to be able to kind of fully define this figure that's here quite yet. So I'm actually not going to define it in terms of the origin just quite yet. What I'm going to do is if I go to this little uh, drop down here, so it says display slash delete relations. So this is just a good way, clicking this button is just a good way to display some of the relations that we already have between some of our entities on this sketch. However, this is not actually what I'm concerned about. If I click on that drop down, we'll see that this last option here has fully defined sketch. So if I click on this, it actually gives a whole lot of information. Um, I believe when you first open this up, these two drop down tabs are closed. Um, you don't necessarily need to open them up, but it's just a good way to kind of get an idea of some other information that's going on. All it's saying in this dimensions portion is it's referencing our origin. It's saying that, well, we need to have some sort of reference point, and that point is going to be our origin. And then kind of the two main options that we have here are entities to fully define. Well, one of them is all entities in the sketch, and the other is selected entities. If I want to, or if I already have parts of the sketch that are fully defined, then I can just specify, hey, I, I don't really know what's wrong with this edge here. It's not giving me, or it's not telling me that it's fully defined. What am I still missing? So that's a way that you can just click on that specific edge or arc, whatever it might be, and it will automatically put it in reference to something else, preferably the origin. But let's say I don't have any of these things fully defined as they are. They do have dimensions, but when I hit this, it assigned a couple things. So there's a few things here that I didn't already have. So this, if I move out of this menu, oh, I shouldn't have clicked out of that, darn it. Let me go back to that and then hit enter. So now it actually added some dimensions here, and we actually notice that our sketch is now fully defined, regardless of it being underdefined beforehand. So I can play with these dimensions a little bit more if I want to, but the main purpose here is that now I don't have to worry about my sketch being underdefined. It already made the necessary adjustments. Um, let's say I didn't actually know this distance here. So if I get rid of that, come on. Maybe it'll... If I just remove that, it's going to say that there are only certain entities now that aren't fully defined on our sketch. Uh, what indicates level of definition again? What do you mean by that? Uh, 
oh, underdefined versus fully defined. Yeah. So uh, I guess the best way that I could put it is, and yeah, the best way that I can kind of phrase it is that an underdefined sketch means that there are certain entities on our sketch that are ambiguous. So even if I, even if I, here's what I'm actually going to do. I'm going to go back to before I fully defined everything. So there. So now I have most of my measurements already in place. If I add this, I don't even need to, I already have that there. Even though this has most of the dimensions already assigned to it, even if I add a dimension to this as well, let's just say that this is 40, I can still move this sketch around. Nothing will change on the sketch itself, but it's kind of loose, if you will. Think about it like just a loose screw or a loose part. It doesn't really have any location that it's specified to. And that could be an issue if we're trying to create other sorts of sketches, either on this plane or on future planes, that might, ha might take issue if I start playing around with this sketch. What a fully defined sketch does for me is it means that it's locked in place. Uh, and it means that it's a little bit easier to assign dimensions if I need to. Even if I assign the necessary dimensions with accordance to the origin, if I start playing around or trying to maybe move certain things around, it might contort my shape in a way that I actually don't want it to. So, or I, I, how I actually don't want it to function. So if I say, well, that's nine away, and this is... Just say that's four away. Well, now things are fully defined, but maybe I didn't have, say, this measurement here. So that means that it can move just in this direction. Now, occasionally, if you start getting rid of some of these other relations here, you might start see you might start to see parts of these move around when you actually move this in whatever given direction. Um, I can't really give a good example right now just because uh, it. I can't really think of a good way to break this uh, at this moment, but typically if you try to start moving stuff around, either just as a rigid sketch, if other things aren't defined appropriately, it might start to make adjustments that you don't actually want. So like that, for instance. I took away the tangency that was here, but when I started to move this around, look at how this shape is changing. I don't want that to happen, regardless of whether I want to move my sketch around or not. Now it's completely changed from what it was before. So that's kind of the purpose of fully defining your sketch. If I had a fully defined sketch, even if I didn't have the relations with regard to the origin, things would at least by and large still remain static on this sketch. We wouldn't be getting this weird kind of contorting going on with our shape. Because right now, this these two radii are completely changing as a function of y, which is very strange. It's not something that you want out of your sketch. So that's sort of the purpose of making sure all of your things are fully defined there. And even if I wanted to, for whatever reason, let's just say that this was the sketch that I wanted it to be, I can just fully define it again. And now I can't move it around anymore because it's defined nine units away in the X direction and 3.4 units, 3.43 units away in the Y direction, but it's at least rigid. Even if I deleted these two distance dimensions, I wouldn't get a shape that's going to move around on me, or rather it wouldn't change on me in an unnecessary or rather a uh, uh, an unfavorable manner. So kind of what I'm what I'm getting at here is that this should be a good tool that all of you utilize. And by and large, there shouldn't be many instances or reasons that sketches turn out underdefined. Um, so I, I have been trying to be relatively lenient with regard to uh, grading things and making sure that if it is underdefined, then 
at least most of it is defined in some manner or another by virtue of smart dimensioning things. With this tool, you guys should by and large, like 90% of the time, have your sketches fully defined. Um, if there's ever a time where you're just like, man, I don't know why this part of the sketch is still not fully defined. It's still blue and the rest of the sketch is black. Just use that, that button that's there. It's not going to show it now since we have a fully defined sketch, so there's no reason for it. But try to use that tool if you are in a position where you can't find out what's wrong with your sketch, why it's still underdefined. It's a good resource to have. Like I said, I kind of just figured out about, or uh, found out about it recently as well. Um, so, let's move on to the shell feature. So, this is one of the two features that we're going to be primarily talking about today. Um, and it's pretty cool. Think about it as just a better way to do maybe a very specific extrude cut on an object. So let's say, and this would be a very poor uh, sketch to create a shell on, so I'm going to make something far sim simpler. So, and Let's just make this even a little bit more complex. Not too crazy. Something that kind of has maybe like an L shape to it like this. Thicker L. And then I'm going to define some of my stuff. So let's say this is 40. Let's say this is 80. Let's say this is, I don't know, 35. And let's say, I believe, Nope, I already have that measurement here. Let's say this is like 85. So I have a nice fully defined sketch here. I'm going to extrude this so I have a shape to work with. Let's bump this up to like 75. So I have some sort of geometry that looks like this. And maybe I want to hollow it out. Maybe I want to have something that has a nice uniform thickness along this body. And it's empty on the inside. Uh, so it'll, it will have an open face to it, but the rest of the geometry has a uniform thickness to it. So this is where our shell feature is going to come in place. So if we are looking at our geometry, then if we're in our Features tab, it's kind of right next to our linear pattern near the bottom. You'll see something that says Shell. So this will allow us to hollow out our part to make sure that we have a uniform thickness on the inside of a shape. So this can be super useful. Granted, you could do something very similar to this using an extrude and then an extrude cut, but this is at least an easier way of doing it. It's a nicer way to kind of, as I've said like four times now, to get a uniform thickness across our geometry. So I'm just going to select this top face. I'm going to bring down maybe this size, maybe to about five. I always like the show preview option. So we can kind of already see right here, this little ghost image of what our shape is going to look like. On top of that, we can also shell it outward if we want to and kind of as, most of you might suspect, it's just going to end up starting and kind of creating a five millimeter thickness on the outside of this shape. And then this, uh, um, the edge here already is going to kind of be the inside of the shape as opposed to being the outside of it right now. So, I mean, if you click on that, you'll see what I mean. We can see that it's almost like an extrusion only on the outside of this. But I wanna shell it inwards. So I'm going to select that hit OK, then we can see we have pretty nice looking shape. It is open on the inside, just as we would suspect, hence the name shell. So we've created this shell here. Um, there's also some other features that are involved and we kind of might have just very slightly seen it down in the bottom here. And this is a multi thickness shell as well. So if I wanted to, it's kind of simple. It's not 
a variable thickness where you could put in, say, an equation. At least I don't think you can do anything like that, but I could entirely be wrong. But if I select other faces on this geometry, then I would be able to assign a different thickness to those parts of it. So let's say I want to maybe make these two faces right here on the inside be thicker than the other faces that are there. So I'm going to select both of those and you'll see they pop up in pink now and it starts it off with the same thickness as what we originally start with. So let's say kind of like what I said, maybe I want to bump it up to say 15 in a case like this. Um, or heck, maybe I want to bump it up to 20, kind of see what happens. I'm not entirely sure why that one's not actually showing. Oh, I didn't even know that. So you can actually select different thicknesses for any of those faces that are in there. So I could still have, say, one of the faces be 15, and I would have the other one be 20 millimeters. But I guess for the sake of ease, let's just make both of them 20 units. And when I hit OK, we'll see that these two faces on the inside have a much thicker profile on our shell than the rest of the faces on this geometry. So, and we can also just kind of measure it if we like. If I select both of these edges, it says down at the bottom here that the normal distance between the two is 20 millimeters, exactly what we should suspect. Um, and similarly, if I just click on these two here, we have a five millimeter thickness as we would suspect. So this is a good way of actually getting very precise measurements with regard to individual faces on your geometry if you want to create a shell. Um, I can also select faces that are directly next to each other. So if I get rid of both of these faces, just to kind of simplify things, so I'll delete both of these. And let's say I want to have something that's a little bit more open kind of a, a bit more of an open shape to it. I might not only select this top face, but maybe I'll select this one as well. You can kind of see that that ghost image got removed from this face. So if I hit okay on this, it actually creates something that's much more open, kind of like almost a doorway. So you can create a lot of kind of, I don't want to say too complex, but uh, more complex shells um, and get a bit more control with what you want to shell um, or what you want your shape to look like. If I want to go back and edit this and kind of create something that's even more open, I could essentially get rid of that face as well. So we now have kind of this little like enclosure looking shape that you could technically create something like this using a couple of extrusions and extrude cuts. I probably wouldn't recommend it just because it's a whole lot easier to just create the very base shape and then hollow things out kind of as we've shown right here. Um, so let's see. Um, so we kind of already went through the different parts of the shell menu. We have our distance or rather the thickness of the shell, the individual faces that we want to shell, whether we're shelling this on the inside or outside, showing the preview, which is always nice, and then the multi-thickness setting as well, which I didn't even know you could assign different thicknesses to each individual face in there. So that's actually something that's pretty cool uh, as well. Um, yeah, that's really, really about it with regard to the shell function. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the next one now, which is rib. So rib is a way that we can kind of create extrusions based upon a single sketch. Uh, and I know we've already been doing that. You're probably saying, well, why would we need to learn something like that? We've already done that just by sketching something and then extruding it. Uh, the nice thing about the rib feature is that it has a whole lot more function to it. You can kind of get a little bit more savvy, if you will, with a lot of your extrusions that you might want to make. Um, so the nice thing about the rib function is that we can actually start it either from an existing uh, sketch or sketch plane, or we can choose one that's already on our 
geometry right now, if you will. So what I want to do is I want to create some kind of, maybe some kind of internal uh, extrusion that might be on the inside of this kind of hollowed out region, but it won't be included on this kind of cutout right here. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to select rib. And then it's already telling me, hey, we don't have a sketch uh, to work with. So you're either going to need to select a sketch that already exists, or perhaps select a sketch plane and then create something. So let's just start from scratch. Let's just create some sort of sketch that we would like to see an extrusion of. So I'm going to select this top plane here. So it already knows that whatever our sketch is going to be, it's going to be aligned with this top kind of thick, th or yeah, this top like shell uh, face here. And like before, I don't want it extending off into this uh, open region. The one thing that we always want to do whenever we're using the rib function, or feature rather, is that if it's assuming that we're extruding it towards the geometry, we can't have it extruding towards an open part of the geometry. It'll start giving us issues, and I can kind of demonstrate that here in just a sec. But let me actually just start sketching. So I'm going to make sure that we're nice and aligned so we can kind of get some proper measurements. Uh, I'm just going to do something that might look kind of like this. Something pretty simple so far. I might add, like, say, a circular region to it, and I'm actually going to do something like this. I'm just going to trim away some random stuff that we have. So let's say we have something like that looks like this. It's not too crazy, but it's a little bit more complex than some of the geometries that we might typically be working with. Oop, that's not what I wanted. Let's just say that this is like 8.25 or something. And then just for the sake of it, I'm going to use our fully defined sketch. So I don't really know right off the top of my head why it's giving me some issues. So I'm just going to have it figure it out. So it basically said, hey, I needed another relation uh, with regard to the origin over here on this corner, it assigned it, and now we actually do have a fully defined sketch. So pretty cool. Uh, and now, since I had selected the rib feature before going into the sketch, once I exit this sketch, it's automatically going to say, oh, okay, this is the sketch that you want to uh, create your rib of. So it's already giving us some other stuff here. So the first thing that I want to go through is these thickness settings. Um, these are sort of defining the, uh, basically where the thickness is starting from. Um, so this very first one is first side. I really don't know the difference between first and second side other than them being on either side of that sketch plane. So this right here would be assuming that we would be creating an extrusion in the positive y direction of our entire geometry. But we don't really want something like that anyway because it's kind of going off into nowhere. It doesn't actually even intersect with our sketch at all. And even if I chose this one here, well, yeah, it would intersect with the sketch, but it's part of it. This thickness right here is just going to go off into infinity. So it's not actually going to intersect with anything. So what I actually want to do is I want to look at this extrusion direction. The two options we have here are parallel to the sketch, which it's selected currently. Our sketch plane was this top one here, so it should be going on some plane that is basically in the same plane or parallel to what we drew on, or it could be normal or perpendicular to the sketch, which is going to point it up and down or in the positive and negative x direction when I hit this. So this is more along the lines what I want to see. So something that kind of has this look to it right here. So now I always like doing the both sides because it's pretty much just taking that thickness that's there and assigning it to each of those individual directions. So I don't really know why it's not. Maybe I need to decrease this a little bit. Let's say that's like a four, there we go. So now what it's going to do here is it's going to create the thickness of this profile and extrude it down until it comes in contact with the shape. 
or the geometry rather. So it should work. There we go. So it's created this sort of shape here as an extrusion. So what's nice about this is that, and I know we had ways of doing it, we had our thin features, but this is a cool way of just creating other sorts of extrusions based on simpler sketches with relation to a current part that we already have or a current geometry that we already have in place. So one thing that we might want to be a little careful about here is let's say we have maybe a similar sketch. I'm actually just going to suppress this for a second and I'm going to create something that's kind of similar only it'll be a proof of concept of when you should be cautious about using the rib feature. So I'm sketching on this plane once more. I'm just going to start here, go down, and I'm going to go a little bit off. So now this is implying that if we did have a rib, it actually, if I look at it from this shape, there would actually be part of it that would just be shooting off the sketch itself. And you'll notice, I'm not going to fully define this right now, but you'll notice that if I try this, it's going to give me some issues. The rib is not bounded properly. The extension of the rib does not intersect the part model. So occasionally we need to be very careful if our sketch is not actually intersecting the geometry at all points during that extrusion that it's going to make. So those are instances that we need to be a little bit cautious. So let me illustrate perhaps another point. And we're going to talk a little bit about datum planes as well. Uh, and I know datum planes are kind of a little bit tricky, or at least tricky to create uh, from time to time, but they can be very helpful, especially when we're using the rib feature. So the first thing that I'm actually going to do is I want, I want a datum plane that's kind of going parallel to this face here but it's more kind of in the middle. So I'm just gonna select that bottom face. I'm going to go to my reference geometry and I'm gonna hit plane. It's now created a plane. I'm going to increase it, just kind of make sure it's more in the center. Cool, so we have this plane here and I'm going to use this as a sketch plane right now. So I'll go back to my sketch. It already is saying, oh cool, you wanna sketch on plane one here. So it's already selected going to make sure that I'm normal to it and then I'm just going to start drawing a little bit and I'll make this one at least a little bit simpler in this case so I'll align it like that I'll fully define it just so that it doesn't yell at me and then I'm going to exit the sketch so now we have something that it's still parallel with the same face that I originally sketched on, only now it's just a little bit lower. I essentially just took another sketch and I just lowered it such that it was kind of inside of this shell instead. So this is a good way of being able to kind of illustrate both of the features now. As you can already see, it's already selected the parallel to the sketch function and it wants to push it kind of outward. Um, I don't necessarily want to do that because if I try it, it's still going to yell at me. It's saying that, I mean, first of all, it's not intersecting the existing model at all. So if I want to, I can flip the side. And this might work, but my worry is that it might see this kind of pretty straight line and think that it's intersecting with itself. Yeah, so now it's kind of intersecting with itself on this edge. So let me actually try to adjust that a little bit. I want to be able to still use that rib feature. Um, I'm gonna make this 50. So now it's lower than where it started with. So each of these points should be able to attach to this side. Should be, we'll see. Now, if I try to use this as a rib, and I'll flip the side, and it should work properly now. And it does, cool. So you would need to make sure that it doesn't intersect with itself. So what it actually kind of did, here's kind of cool. It created almost like another shelf inside of this shape that we already have. 
Um, but what's also nice is I could shift this shape perpendicular to the sketch plane as well if I wanted to. So I'm going to go back to the feature menu. So as it currently stands, it's basically throwing that extrusion out towards the walls. If I want to, I could make sure that it throws it towards the bottom, also makes it like, or almost makes it like another wall on the inside. So now we have kind of an interior wall on the inside of this kind of shell, this open shell shape that we have here. So this is a good way of using datum planes to kind of get maybe the geometry that you want with regard to using the rib feature. And we can also be even a little bit more complex than this. Let's say we wanted to create a plane or even create a rib that's not even parallel or perpendicular to anything. Let's say that maybe it was just going to be a, uh, what is it? Say just uh, angled uh, plane already. So I can do that as well. So I'll suppress this just so we can kind of keep those in our back pocket. Um, and I'm just going to hide this plane as well because I don't want it showing up. So I'll hide it. Let's say I wanted maybe some sort of rib that was connecting from this edge down here all the way up to that edge up top. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to select both of those edges because I want there to be a plane that exists from this edge down to this edge that I can sketch on. So kind of like our earlier discussion where we were talking about datum planes the very first time around, if I have two, in this case, parallel lines, I can create a plane from those. And just because I had selected both of those parallel lines beforehand, those parallel edges rather, it's already going to assign that sketch plane accordingly, which is super nice, super handy. So if I just create this plane, and now I actually want to sketch on this. So I'll go here, I'm going to go normal to it. So this button right here, where it kind of has this uh, arrow pointing perpendicular to a plane, means it'll just orient my view normal to this. So that's not really what I wanted, but I can work with this. Uh, so I'm just going to start sketching on this plane. Um, and it already knows, okay, we're, we're going to sketch on this plane um, and it should do things appropriately. And the nice thing is that it's already kind of getting some of the reference geometry, some of the edges that already exist. So if I want it to be aligned maybe somewhere specific on this edge, I can do that, like this midpoint between this or these two endpoints. So let's actually just do that. So I'll do something like that, and then that, and then maybe I want it to kind of be horizontal with that same line. So again, I'll make sure that that line gets fully defined. And now we have some kind of a sketch that looks like this. So it doesn't look really too different than the sketch or the rib that we had made in this previous one, but it's on a completely different sketch plane now. So that kind of introduces its own complexity. Uh, if you click the normal, it will flip it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I... I vaguely remember that. <laughs> I just wasn't testing it that much. Um, so if we go back to our rib now, it'll kind of be selecting pretty similar options. I want it going towards this face, kind of the one that we are expecting it to go towards. So I'll flip it to normal to the sketch. And I might want to reduce the, uh, the thickness of this a little bit. So if I actually just hit this, I'm not entirely sure if it might work. Okay, it actually will. Occasionally, if the thickness is too great to the point of it overlapping on another face, SolidWorks might not be too happy about that. So sometimes you might need to reduce the thickness of those uh, of the rib that you create to make it at least a little bit uh, to allow it to function. Um, but here we've we've created that exact 
shape, just that extrusion towards the geometry that already existed. So here we've created three different kinds of ribs, all in a variety of different ways. I mean, if we kind of go through them one more time, and I'll suppress them one by one or unsuppress them, we had one where we just originally selected a sketch plane that already existed, um, which was this very top sketch plane, and then just created that geometry, as it were. We had another one where we needed to create a sketch plane. Oop, let me hide that one as well. Where we had to create a sketch plane that was lower than what we, or rather, not one that already existed, but it was still parallel or perpendicular to some other faces that we already had, some existing geometry that we already had. We were able to create, uh, I mean, technically two different ribs from that, one where it goes downward and another where it kind of creates like a shelf. Then the final one was creating an even more complex datum plane first. Oop, it's trying to do it one more time where we had to create an even more complex datum plane, but we were still able to create a rib from that slanted datum plane. Um, and from there, we were able to uh, kind of create any kind of complex geometry. Heck, if I even want to go back and edit the sketch, make it even a little bit crazier, say I want to maybe add a line going out, and why the heck not? Let's just add, say, like a circle to it, or like something like this. Oh, that's a bit too big. Something like that. This, feasibly, should still work here. So if I exit sketch, uh-oh. <laughs> because an endpoint is wrongfully shared by multiple entities. So that's why it, it's usually a bit nicer to create kind of open sketches. So let's say I go back to this and I just make this say an arc instead. So I'm, I'm just going to kind of trim away a part of it, if it lets me. Better yet, let's just do this. I'll get rid of that guy. And then we'll just create some kind of arc. Arcs are cooler anyway. There. There. Then... There we go. Now, here, if I actually just get rid of this rib first, and then re redo it. If I select that sketch, we have one open profile. Please select the sketch. Fix the profile. Uh-oh. It might not like it that I'm kind of intersecting it right here like this. Sometimes it doesn't quite like uh, geometries like that. How do you make it flip and go the other way? So if you're using, say, the... Uh, let me get back to SolidWorks. If you're using just the arc tool... Here, I'll open that sketch back up. I really like using the three-point arc, which is one of your drop-down options. Um, so that first specifies, here, I'll, I'll do something like this, actually. I know you're going to be a pain. It allows you to kind of specify, like, two locations, like your two endpoints first, and then you can drag out that radius however you see fit. Um, and then I can I can still adjust the radius of this should I need to, and it's just going to kind of shrink things down accordingly. Then maybe I just recreate this line. Then if I exit this sketch, this time, third time's a charm, should be nice. There we go. So I can still edit those sketches. It's a little bit finicky with some of the options. I might have to take a look at kind of certain things that it allows and does not allow. Uh, but you can edit the sketches so long as you're you're not kind of creating too drastic a difference in, in what the original sketch actually was. Um, so this is 
really about it uh, with regard to the features today. I, I know, geez, that went by kind of quick. It was only about 45 minutes that we talked about that or all those things. So that might have been like a whole bunch of, here's a bunch of knowledge, have fun. Um, but if anybody has any questions right now, ask away. Uh, because I do kind of want to play around with like the rib a little bit more, so I, I kind of understand maybe the do's and don'ts um, of what I'm allowed to do. Uh, can you do a quick demonstration again of the first concept? Oh, so like the uh, the shell? Yes, so I can do that. Um, and I know I go through a handful of details in the PowerPoint with regard to uh, using the rib function kind of with datum planes or with just other planes. So there's some rudimentary basics there, uh, but it's obviously a little bit more handy if you're just kind of playing around with it as you go. Uh, if you wanted the rib to merge, how would you do that? Um, merge with what? I guess I should say, like intersecting, like if I wanted maybe these two edges to intersect with each other or be one edge instead. I think what I can do, I think I can turn this into a circle too. Uh, perhaps with no edges tangent to the outer shell. Tangent to the outer shell. Um, if you mean like right here, well, it's, it's still going to touch that edge. Uh, you just need to kind of make sure that it's 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 not overlapping that sketch that's there let me let me first go through kind of going through the shell one more time and then and then we can kind of maybe talk a little bit more about that uh miranda okay so i'm going to suppress this guy as well and i'm just going to kind of start off with maybe a new i'm just going to start off with a new part to kind of demonstrate the the shell one more time so I'm going to just create a base sketch. So nothing too crazy. Maybe I will just create something kind of like a rectangle with one side, kind of round it out, something similar to that. Uh, I don't like that. I want that and trim that away. So something kind of just in this shape. And then if I extrude this, let's do like 40. Basically all I want to do is if I go to the shell option in the features tab, the first thing that I'm going to want to do is I want to select a face. So that face is going to indicate where the shell is going to be open. Um, so that initial face is basically the opening of the shell. So if I hit show preview, and then technically, I guess you don't even need to create or select any faces, it'll just create an internal shell by default. But any faces that you select are going to be considered to be open. So if I maybe drop this down to say like 2.5, then it's going to be a relatively thin uh, face or a relatively thin uh, shell that we have. I can also select other faces here to kind of create maybe the slot shape that we have. Um, perhaps I want different parts of this to have varying thicknesses. So I could use the multi thickness setting. So let's say I want, uh, I selected the wrong one. Let's say I want, there we go. Let's say I want these two faces here to have a thickness of say one, or let's do like five and five. So actually 
for the multi-thickness setting option, it allows you to designate a thickness for each one individually, uh, which is nice in the setting. So it actually kind of contorts the geometry a little bit, makes things look kind of weird as we can see here. Might not even shell properly, it actually does. Um, but that's just a way that we can sort of create more complex uh, shells to our base geometry if we're trying to hollow parts of it out. So maybe I don't want both of these, but maybe I want, say, this shell to look like that, and then this one to be kind of thicker on this base. So I might bump that up to, say, 15. So it kind of pushes this up a little bit higher, making this to have a thickness of 15, whereas these edges around here have a thickness of 2.5, which is, I believe, what we selected. Yeah, 2.5. Uh, hopefully that kind of goes over like the uh, shell a little bit better there, Nathan. Um, thinking to shell the top. Let me take a look. I don't even remember what that first one is there. Huh. So that is a good way that you can do it. Yeah. Uh, so one way that you can create that shape is to kind of think about it in a similar way to how you guys did the uh, uh, the screw homework assignment, where you kind of create half of your geometry and then do a revolve. For one like that, for the in-class assignment, what my suggestion would be to, to do, shell it at the very end. So the interesting thing about the shell function is that it's kind of taking order into account, which, and I, I'll, I'll try to maybe explain that just by doing a little example, maybe to, maybe to kind of show it a little bit better. Maybe on the right. Ah, yes, that's a good question. So for any of you who are looking at the in-class assignment uh, 4A, the kind of circular view on the far right, not the actual model itself, is actually giving you a detailed view of that curved region of the sketch. So you can kind of see that if you're looking more at that sketch, it kind of has different radii depending on what part of the geometry you're actually looking at. Um, so basically what's going on there is that you want to you want to make sure that that all of those curves are there appropriately. And that's kind of why I said that you you want to do your shell last. I just realized I don't think I actually gave a dimension to that top curve there. So in the detailed view, kind of that, that one right in the middle on the outside does not have a radius value to it. So I'll figure that out here in just a sec. Um, yeah, let me, one, one thing at a time, or else I'll get off, off track. Uh, so let me go back and just delete this right here. And what I'm about to show you guys, I, I, I kind of want you to take it into consideration because this actually will be somewhat important for the homework assignment. Um, so you guys can take a look at that if you want to right now, but I, I kind of want you guys to just pay attention to this real quick. So let's say I already have this geometry here. I already have shelled it out. Um, but I want to maybe build something on top of this. I want to create maybe like a, another, an extra extrusion on the very top of this. So I'll just select this as my face that I'm going to be working with. Um, I want to orient this a little bit better so I don't get a headache. Uh, and I'm going to create some that looks like that. I'll say it's, I don't know, eight and a half from that side. It's 12 from that side. It's got a thickness of 40 or a width. 
and then maybe this height is say like 10, oh, 10. Uh, and then I want to extrude this. That's a bit higher than I want it to be. Let's say it looks something like that. So I have a shape that kind of looks like this. So, okay, big whoop, big deal. Um, but let's say I hadn't done this shell quite yet. So I'm actually going to suppress that shell. So I kind of end up with this very first thing that I originally started with. If I shell it now, I want you all to think about what might happen if we're just looking at this geometry. I'm just going to take a second and have you kind of all look at it. I'm not going to call out anybody, but I want you all to think of what would happen if I shelled the exact same face now. Now if I click on this, and maybe unless SolidWorks proves me wrong, we now have a slot there. So because this is a merged geometry, it's taking into account that we had that slot there and that this has a width large enough such that a two and a half millimeter uniform thickness could create a gap there as well. So this goes back to what I was saying a moment ago with the shell function order matters. If you kind of remember anything with regard to this feature, order matters. Because if I go back and I suppress this, and then I just put the original one back, that slot isn't there. And if we're looking at our feature tree, that's because in terms of the order, we first had our extrusion, we then shelled that original extrusion, and then we created another extrusion essentially on top of the shell. So we've created something after the shell has already happened. Kind of going back, if I resuppress that and unsuppress what I just had, after the second extrude, we now have that slot that is there. So again, this is kind of an important thing and hopefully it will prevent some frustration from you guys if you're working or if you end up working on that uh, most recent homework assignment um, because I won't really go into much details about what could happen, but I'm sure you all, if you take a look at that homework assignment, you'll see what I mean or you might have an idea of what I mean. Um, okay, let me... Let me actually first go back to that homework assignment. I want to open that back up just because I want to make sure that I actually defined that uh, that one curve there. So I'll, I'll re-upload this sketch. Yeah, I, I don't think this curve here I had originally assigned a measurement for, unless I'm just blind and I can't see it. Okay. And to also preface, I'm sure you guys can probably imagine after I just kind of harped on the order matters bit, but that matters for this in-class assignment as well. So the order in which you are going to shell your shape would probably be a point of contention, would probably be something that you want to be very aware of. Um, just to prevent any further headache while you're working on this assignment. Okay, so the radius of curvature kind of right here at the second lip is going to be, what is that, a quarter inch? And this is also a quarter inch. So both of these curves here are a quarter inch. And this is just saying that we have a fifth of an inch, so 0.2 inches throughout. So this entire region here is 0.2 inches throughout. I've already given some other measurements. I'll re-upload this just so you guys have it in case you uh, don't finish this assignment today. So that's, that's a good question. Um, and that's something that isn't really going to be... I would say very much known. Um, 
but I guess a good indicator is that, and, and I'll kind of go through this. So I know one of the previous homework assignments, we, we talked a little bit about cross sections, or we had some stuff that contained sections. So anytime you see something that says section AA or BB or whatever the heck it might be, and you see this figure on one of your figures, this right here is indicating that you have a cross section. When you see this hatch mark here, so these kind of slashed lines going like in a positive slope, I guess you could say, that's indicating that we have solid geometry there. If it's blank, like how it kind of is on the inside of this shape, that's indicating that we don't have, uh, or, or it's empty rather. So this right here is telling us that we have, I guess if I kind of go into some details, it's telling us that we have an internal diameter of 3.1 and we have an external diameter of 3.5. Well, this makes sense because we have a thickness on both sides of it. So we have this thickness doubled added to the internal diameter. So 0.2 doubled is 0.4. 0.4 plus 3.1 is going to be a 3.5. So by and large, most of the things should already be indicated here, just showing that uh, we do have a hollowed out region on the inside of this. I, I know it looks a little bit weird, uh, but I was kind of just trying to model this after like a Hydra flask. <laughs> so that's kind of the general idea. I guess at the end of the day, probably could have added like a title here. Here, I'll do it. This is basically a hydro flask. So think that it should have some kind of thickness to it by and large throughout. It'll have an hollowed out internal um, and it just has some some height and uh, to, to both the uh, the mouthpiece as well as the, uh, the the body to it. For the most part, yeah. Um, I'll try to make sure that things are indicated well. Like if I if I wanted to, and really the only reason I didn't do this, but if I wanted to, I could have done kind of like a whole call out, similar to what we were doing with regard to the whole wizard. But this is kind of, I don't want to say it's complicated, but this doesn't really tell you a whole lot that you don't already know. Because a lot of those measurements are already indicated kind of on this outside feature. So this right here is already saying that the body of this from bottom to top or from kind of flat edge to flat edge is going to be nine inches. And from that same top to the following top is going to be 1.5 inches. So this right here, I think, is a better indicator of uh, of some of the dimensions rather than doing, say, a whole call out kind of like you would do in a um, for for like using the whole wizard. Yeah, I, I agree. It it would be fairly redundant, um, and I wouldn't say that this is too bad. I hope, <laughs> but. It's already a little bit cluttered. I don't want to make that worse. <laughs> um, that just sounds like a bad time overall. Um, I, I want to make these drawings as, as kind of comprehensive as possible. So you guys aren't looking at things and being like, I have no idea what you're trying to indicate there. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to re-upload the PDF of this, just so if anybody doesn't get to it today, they'll still have it. But really the only thing, uh, whatever, uh, the only thing that I changed was I just added um, a dimension to one more of those curves. Hopefully that dinging noise isn't
blown out your guys' eardrums. It's notorious for that. Okay. I re-uploaded the PDF of that in-class assignment, so it should have that extra dimension uh, there for that outside curve, just so that you guys aren't um, scratching your head wondering what the heck that radius could be. Um, let me actually just go back on this one. And then if any other adjustments need to be made, you guys can yell at me and tell me that I missed something. Um, and in the meantime, I mean, if any of you have questions about the homework, the homework assignment due tonight, I know that one might be a little bit more pressing. So if, if anything, any of those things stand out, speak now and we'll make sure that that gets sorted. Uh, check the mass property of the Lego piece for the homework and it doesn't match what the sheet says the mass should be. Does it matter that it's slightly different? I believe all the measurements are correct on my part. Um, I mean, if it's like within a reasonable tolerance, like if it's like 0.1 or like less than that off, I'm, I'm not going to pitch a fit. Uh, if it's more than that, then then that might be a cause of concern um, just to kind of determine maybe there's something up with the sketch that's a little bit off or strange. Um, other than that, uh, as long as, as I said, kind of long story short, as long as it's within a reasonable tolerance, I don't want to put a hard and fast rule on that, but I mean, if it's like 0.1 off, like a tenth of a cubic unit that's really not a big deal um i think sometimes yes she says so that i i might be a little bit concerned about i i might take a look at maybe some more of the measurements um so i, I guess the first thing that might be pointed out is try to pay attention to maybe your shell um, if that doesn't have anything that's kind of alluding to what the issue might be, uh, we can try and take a look at it otherwise. Not the material assignment to be applied if you specify it on the homework. Yeah, so think about it like this. Um, and I don't want this to sound too much like it's a, like, hey, I'm, I'm just doing this for my benefit kind of thing. But if you have the correct material assignment and you have the correct geometry, implying that you have maybe not an identical, but pretty darn close, the idea there is that the mass should come out to be the same within a very, very close tolerance. Um, so it, it's a good way for me to kind of double check to make sure that all of your measurements are correct uh, and to make sure that we're not missing anything there. So I mean, like for the case of Nathan, I would probably take at least another quick look at those measurements. I think I went through it myself just the other day um, and I was able to get the same measurement that was on there. If that is turning out to be a point of contention for a lot of people, I'll double check it and make sure that maybe I didn't screw up or, or maybe there is something that's that's strange going on with that mass measurement um, in addition to like what the geometry is and, and what the volume of the shape is. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, I would be careful about that 1.5 dimension. Um, take one more look at the diagram on the far left. So basically what that's saying is that you're, you're here, I can show it right here. 
that's basically saying that your 2.5 radius of curvature is happening first, and then from that edge that's tangent to it, then it moves up 0.5 units. So you want to just be a little bit cautious with, I think, some of your measurements um, and how things are being properly defined. That would probably be the best way of doing it. Um, I, I would assume that if you delete that dimension, it'll be a little bit happier. Uh, because if you kind of see what's going on on the sketch, not only do we have that 1.5, but this also has a different uh, radius to it, or diameter, same thing. Um, but it does have a different radius to it. Um, so I, I would probably add some of your curvature values later. Um, however you want to do it. And, and just so you guys remember, um, y'all are probably sick of me saying this by this point. If you're not, I'd be surprised. Uh, just by looking at like you sh sharing that screenshot, that's not even how I originally did it, how I originally made the sketch. And that's a perfectly fine way of doing it. Um, and even then, there's ways that you could make your sketch even simpler while still being able to add features later on. So remember some of the features that we went over just the other day, I say just the other day, but like last week, some of our fillet and chamfer features where we can add features to existing geometries after the fact. So that's kind of a little hint that some of you guys can say, okay, my sketch might not look what it should be or look like what it should be, but I can make adjustments as I go. And those adjustments don't even have to be with regard to just editing the sketch. Uh, I was thinking if I set the red to 0.5, it would extend. Yes, uh, I don't even think I went through that, and that is totally my fault. So I don't actually quite know if it kind of does a mid-plane. Let's take a look. So let's just say I bring, say, like this original one back from this very first thing that we did. This thickness here is 4 millimeters. So we have a 4 millimeter thickness throughout. And I used something that was also, that was already four millimeters. So yes, it, it is kind of like the mid-plane option of your extrusion, where if you set it to be 10, it's going to extrude outward in both directions by five. For something like this, just like what, I, what we kind of showed right there, it created something of four millimeters, so it's actually extruding it out two millimeters in either given direction. Uh, I wasn't actually entirely sure about that, so that's a fantastic thing that we kind of just verified there. Because <laughs> I didn't even know, <laughs> or didn't think about it right off the top of my head. Um, here, let me go back to this so you guys can see it if you're still working on this one.
me also pull up the second in-class assignment as well. So I would say that that one is a little bit trickier just because, hint, hint, you're going to want to use kind of some maybe more uh, savvy datum plane usage. It'll be similar to one of the little uh, little demos that I kind of showed you guys. But I'll keep it on the Hydra Flask one for the time being, unless anybody has questions about the second assignment. And I know I already brought this up, but uh, if anybody is struggling with the homework, Homework three that I believe is due tonight. Um, ask away. I haven't taken a look at how many people have submitted it, but hopefully it is most or all of you. Set the inside radius. So it, it does calculate, uh, or, or rather, it does take into account possible uh, radii, I guess you could say, of curvature. Uh, so that's actually a really good question. Um, and I can kind of illustrate that with one of the examples, say, like this one right here. So I'm actually going to demonstrate on this, and the first thing that I'm going to do, maybe just to make it look a little bit better, is I'm going to make this extrude a bit larger, or kind of like the, make it a bit thicker. So maybe I'll change this instead to say like 15. It's actually a really good question. Um, and then I'm going to exit sketch. And then I want to create a fillet on some of these. So that's too big, but I'll make the adjustment after. So I want to fillet all of those parts there. And I want to do, say, a fillet of, say, like, eh, let's do, like, three. Or, yeah, three. So technically what's going to happen is since I did that after, like I said, for like the nth time, order does matter. So it doesn't know, or rather this shell doesn't know that I've taken this fillet into account. However, if I created another shell, I believe it will. I don't remember what this one even was. It's two and a half. So if I create another shell, make that two and a half. Yeah, there we go. So now you can see it actually does automatically create a radius of curvature. Um, it's not the radius that we had assigned out here. It's a bit different and it's, I would say it's a little bit more random with how it creates it since you are not the one who's assigning that radius. Um, but it, it will create one. So the one thing that I would probably just say to that is, is just you can double check to make sure what that radius of curvature is. I know that it's, it's kind of a weird shape, so it's hard to take a look at. So my suggestion would be to use a, uh, use your, uh, your cross section tool or your section tool. And then you're able to kind of look on the inside. And then when you click on anything that has a fillet, it'll tell you the radius of curvature of that. So you can end up going back into or like kind of cross section it and then taking a look and then saying, oh, yep, it is 0.25 or whatever the heck it should be. What was it labeled as? 
0.45 so this one should still end up being 0.45 and this one should end up being 0.05 should all these other outside dimensions be correct once you shell it uh couldn't find asi 1020 that's weird I am partial to using this uh, drop down. First of all, it should be in the steel. It should actually be one of the first ones that shows up. Uh, it is AISI, so just be careful if you might be putting in ALSL. Yeah, exactly. And then if I apply it, I should label it up there. Hopefully that sorts it, question mark. believe at least i think i think if i change this radius or rather this fillet it might also change the fillet on the inside since it's based on that shell and since it's supposed to have a, a given thickness so if it's not turning out correct or if there is some issue you you can still kind of go back and, and play around with things a little bit if need be so I believe that inside one was about 5.5, .5, so if I change this down to say like 1, and then hit OK, yeah, it, it did change it, so now it's at 3.5. I don't necessarily know what the math is on that, like if you can just say, oh, I, I mean, you probably can. Uh, I don't necessarily know if it's maybe just based upon the thickness because that's a one, this is a one millimeter radius of curvature on the outside. And it's a three and a half uh, on the inside. And this was 2.5. So I think it's just adding it because it's assuming that it has the same center for both radii. So theoretically, you should kind of be able to reason your way through it. Let me actually take a look at the uh, in class assignment see if that's true yeah that actually makes sense because this radius here it's assuming that our circle if we had a full circle would kind of be like have a center like right here just a little bit inward from where that uh where this internal curve actually is if you take 0.2 away from 0.25 you're going to get 0.05 so it actually makes sense. This internal radius is just going to be the external radius minus the thickness. Uh, and similarly for, for this one, since it's now kind of, since this is technically the inside curve, it's adding 0.2 to a 0.25 to get a 0.45. So the math actually does make sense. I'm not entirely crazy. I thought it was some other weird uh, equation when it's literally just adding thicknesses to it. Duh. It's looking pretty good.
Oh, you mean like right here, this guy? How did you, uh, how did you create the, some of the other curves, like at the very bottom or kind of at like the top before like the smaller, uh, cylinder that you made? Did you do it by way of your sketch or did you use something else? A fillet? Yeah. So you can use, I mean, you can use another fillet there as well. Um, so, I mean, just kind of like what I did with this example here, uh, if it goes back, you can fillet another edge. Like if I suppress this for a second, all I had here was an edge. If I just select all of those respective edges that are there and then just hit my fillet option, it'll just fillet those specific edges. I don't have to select a face for it to do it. Um, I mean, if I wanted to, I could, but that's going to fillet more than what I actually want. Um, but for something circular, it should actually be a bit easier because those circular edges are primarily just going to be a single edge that you can just say, hey, I just want to assign a fillet to this edge here that goes around and it'll create things appropriately. <laughs> no worries. Nope, I might send out an announcement or make an announcement. That will be after, like, the lecture after, like, the first uh, exam. So I'll have a whole lecture on it, and I'll probably, like, give you guys a part. Um, and then I'll say, like, hey, define this, or make sure all the measurements are there. Those are a little bit trickier to do. Um, I'm saying that now, but there actually might be an option kind of similar in uh, like the, the sketch menu as there is in, uh, in the sheets where you can, yeah, you might actually be able to fully define everything in here. I have to look it up. Uh, fully defining sketches is a little bit trickier just because sometimes, I mean, first of all, since you're deriving it from part, it's already assuming that everything might be fully defined or everything is already good. But even right now, it's still saying that it's underdefined. So it could potentially be yelling at me right now for just saying, hey, you're not defining things in terms of the origin, get it together. Um, I'm not entirely sure. So I'm going to look more into it between, uh, between like uh, now and when we have that lecture uh, and then we'll kind of be good on that front uh, just because fully defining the sketches can be a, a little bit trickier since you're literally indicating all those measurements you're not just throwing uh, smart dimensioning everything and then you're just it tells you hey this still needs to be smart dimensioned with like the, the minus on the outside Hmm. Thickness value, yes, that does happen from time to time. Um, so it looks like it's indicating all of the regions where you already have the curvature there. Um, that's odd. I'm wondering, perhaps check the thickness of the shell that you made, um, because all of these should shell appropriately if we're looking at this. Um, basically, that's saying that you can't create a shell um, if any of your any of your values or like thickness values are, are kind of smaller than that. 
So, or, okay, let me phrase it like this. Um, if you have a radius of curvature that is smaller than the thickness, it kind of starts having issues with that because now it's saying, well, you're trying to trying to create something that kind of is smaller than what that radius of curvature is allowing you to do. Um, so I, I guess one way that you could do it, um, and let me actually, I'll just kind of give you this as a hint. Um, create any of the fillets that have a smaller radius of curvature than the thickness of the uh, of the shell after. So create this fillet and this fillet after you've created the shape or after you created the shell. And the reason for that is because if you create it before, you're going to get some weird kind of, some weird lip that will like kind of dig in and then go down. So it'll still kind of be like squared off, only it'll it'll look super weird here instead. And it'll kind of create some, some adverse geometry. I guess another way that you can kind of tell the order that you're uh, that you might um, want to to create your shell is that if you have something if you have something where it might be curved on the outside but square on the inside of that, then that means that this fillet was created after. I actually made it. So this right here is implying that there is a square shape on the outside. And if a lot of you guys are kind of struggling with that part, I might just change it because I don't want to cause too much confusion over over that region itself. Because just saying that order matters would make it a little bit trickier. Uh, I have the square shape on the inside, but made flat in the sketch before making the shell. Oh, I see. So sketch before making the shell. So real quick Nathan, when when you say you made the fillet in the sketch before making the shell, are you talking about both the ones on the very bottom and the very top? Or are you talking about a specific fillet? How do I get to see the various? Uh, I was talking about that bottom one, because I think you said in the bottom, the uh, square shape on the inside implied that you did the fillet after you did the shell. I think Cor that's what you were saying. Correct, yeah. So it's, it's kind of similar to, or kind of related to when we were having this discussion where order matters. Mm -hmm. So since I, I have a lot of shells here now, Jesus. Um, since I have this shell, already or after or rather before i've made any sort of fillets here on the outside it's already taken on this square shape on the inside or rather this kind of 90 degree angle even if i start creating fillets on top now here if i do this it's not actually going to affect the one on the inside because order matters. This fillet was created after the shell happened. However, if I just delete that, if I suppress this guy, uh, and if I, I mean, heck, even if I unsuppress that fillet, so now that one in the outside, but then I 
create that shell. Now, since that fillet already existed, and then I shelled it, the shell is going to incorporate the fillet that's on the outside. So the idea there is that if you make a fillet first and then you shell it, you will have a fillet on the inside of that shell. If you shell first and then create the fillet, it should be just a, a perpendicular angle at wherever that fillet would be on the inside, like kind of correlating to where it is on the outside. Hopefully that kind of makes at least a little bit more sense. Yeah, it, it makes sense. I did the um, fillet in the sketch, and I think that's why I was getting that uh, error message when I was doing the shell. Or not the error message, but yeah. just the alert. Because um, yeah. it, kept, it kept the 90 degree angle inside at the bottom where that fillet was. Yeah. I mean, to kind of illustrate that point, kind of what you were getting that, I, I can go at least a little bit more into that. I'm going to just create this fillet again, and I'm actually going to bump it up. I'm going to bump this up to say, I'll just say two. So we now have a two millimeter fillet on the outside, which means that if I do a shell, I will have a fillet on the inside as well. But I'm going to now, and this might work. And when I say work, it might throw an error at me. If I choose a shell value that is smaller than two millimeters, say like 1.5 instead, Okay, oh, because it's, there we go. Okay, it actually is still going to work. So this was two millimeters, then that should be three millimeters. Okay, so it's still adding it there. I wanna create something kind of like that issue at the very top because it, I would suspect more so that where it's talking about the thickness value like is, is greater than the minimum radius of curvature, I think that's more in reference to kind of like the like the mouthpiece curve at the very top of this geometry. Uh, I don't know how to smart dimension the shell, like the 0.05 and the 0.45. So you don't necessarily have to worry about those dimensions because those are automatically being created um, by virtue of, of just having the having those curves on the outside of it. Um, what I would ask you to do, you don't have to do it if you if you think you're your geometry is, is working out well, uh, or it's correct. But I would I would urge most of you guys, if you do want to double check, to just do like a cross section. Um, so like, basically what I'm implying here is let's say I have something like this. Let's say actually, eh, that would mess with my geometry a little bit too much. Since we have such a such a small enclosure, like the, the opening is so small, I would try to do a section view. If you do a section view, then you'll be able to see inside of that sketch a whole lot easier. So once you hit the OK on your section view, you'll be able to see on the inside and be able to kind of gauge the that inside and outside radius and make sure. So you don't have to smart dimension that inside because it's already determining the dimension based upon the outside radius of curvature and the thickness of your shape. But you can check to see if that's the correct radius though. So I mean, if you look down here, it's telling me that this selected face, this one on the inside is 3.5 millimeters. And you can see on the outside, it's two millimeters of radius. So the only reason that they're different here is because it's saying that this point right here, the end of this pink line, is the center of both this outside cur curve and this inside curve. So all it's doing is it's just doing two, the radius of curvature of that outside part, plus the thickness of this shell which is 1.5 so this two on the outside 
plus the 1.5 gives us a 3.5. So that's why this has a radius of curvature of 3.5. You don't need to change this because theoretically it should make that adjustment already for your sketch. Um, so you primarily just need to make sure that your outside dimensions are correct prior to creating your shell. Um, so you, the reason that you don't really like have to smart dimension it is because it's already creating those measurements and those sketches or features just by shelling it. So you shouldn't have to smart dimension anything. Okay, Ethan, so that's just showing you the thickness there. It doesn't show you the, the radius of the arc? Uh, oh, so it, it is and it isn't. <laughs> um, so it's telling me the thickness right here as 1.5, but if you click on that, oh, come on, show it. If you click on that face, if you look at the bottom right, kind of where it says whether your sketch is fully defined or underdefined, it should say radius 3.5 millimeters or whatever the heck the, the radius of curvature is. Um, so that, cool, that's actually a, a pretty useful tool if like you're clicking on other edges and such. So I don't know what the heck this edge length is, but maybe I want to find it out to make sure that it's the correct measurement. So it's telling me right here that it's 19 millimeters. So just clicking on stuff and I mean, I guess knowing where to look also helps. <laughs> but if you click on certain edges or faces, it usually gives you information about them. Um, I mean, heck, if I wanted to, if I wanted to find out what the width of this channel was from like face to face, I could select that face and control select that other face. Now it's telling me the normal distance between them. So the shortest distance between this face and this face, which would be pretty much similar to clicking on that specific edge and then control clicking on that other edge there in it didn't do it for that one. I don't know why, but usually it'll it'll kind of give you information about one or several edges that you give. Yeah, so right there it's telling me, hey, I have a normal distance of 26.06 millimeters. So from this edge completely across to this other edge. Yeah, so there's all sorts of information that's kind of scattered about. Um, and that's why sometimes it can be a bit of a pain to just say, well, where the heck do I even need to look? Uh, how to use rib again on something close to the in-class assignment. Sure. Um, let me, let me open up another part. I'm going to have like 10 parts open. Um, so I'm just going to create kind of a simple shape, but I'm going to do something kind of pretty similar to what I did in the PowerPoint as well. Um, so not like you need to look back at that, but just keep in mind, it'll be fairly similar to what I have there. Um, so I'm going to create something that kind of has like an L shape to it. Um, and this is really just to demonstrate that we can we can use datum planes to create those rib geometries if if that's what we're trying to do. Um, so I'll do that. Hit OK. Now that I've found this, I'm using it so often and. I don't like doing that because I kind of think it's a little bit of crutch, but it's okay. It's it's a useful tool, um, so long as all your measurements are correct. Um, and so I'm going to create something like this, and let's just say I want to extrude it. I'm just going to do a mid-plane so I can extrude it in both directions. Let's do like 175. Hit okay. So if I have something that looks like this geometry here, what I can do is, let's say I wanted to create something that's kind of curved, uh, something that has more of like a curved surface to it, or not curved surface, but rather like a, uh, uh, 
it's it's more on a slant as opposed to being parallel or perpendicular to a specific face. The first thing that I'm really going to want to do is there's no plane here linking this edge to this edge, which means I'm going to have to create one. So this is why, and, and I know they kind of suck from time to time, but this is why datum planes are pretty important because it allows us to create another reference plane that we can sketch all over. So just by clicking on those two edges and then selecting plane in our reference geometry, it already says, hey, I got two parallel lines. They're perfectly good. I can create a plane where uh, those lines are, are on that plane. So now I have something that looks like this. So it's almost kind of like, I mean, it's quite literally a hypotenuse of this right triangle that we've sort of made in this case. Um, and I always like to be normal to this plane. So I'll just hit normal to it in this menu, this one right here, kind of a, where it has like a, one of the blue faces with an arrow pointing perpendicular to it. And now I can sketch all over it. So if I go here and I can just kind of create some crazy stuff, what's nice is that since this line and this line are already on it, and technically it's even taking into account other lines that are not explicitly on this plane, but are still kind of considered reference geometry to this plane. So I'm going to just click on this plane, say, yep, I want to sketch on that one. And now I can create whatever the heck I want. So maybe I want to start right here at the midpoint, coincident to the midpoint, and just sort of create some crazy stuff. So I'll say that that aligns, it's horizontal with that there. Maybe I want to do some kind of funky arc where it'll kind of line up to just that edge. Oh, I screwed that up real good. Oh, come on. So right there, oh my God, can I get it together? There we go. Maybe I want these to be like, say, tangent to each other, just like, since it's nice. Uh, and then this kind of, oh, this kind of goes off in this direction and then it lands like right back at the midpoint of that top line there. So, we have some kind of crazy geometry that looks like this. Maybe I'll say that this is like a 90 degree angle. So we have a right angle there. And then I can assign kind of dimensions to some of these curves. So I can say 26.75, something along those lines. Uh, this should still be tangent to that. I wonder if I could make it kind of like a 90 degree angle there. Eh, not really, but that's fine. Um, and then I want to just fully define this, so it makes sure that, uh-oh, but the sketch is still underdefined to fully define the sketch. Do one of the following. Okay. Maybe I'll actually get rid of that for now since it was yelling at me. Are you going to be happy now? Yes, it will. Okay, cool. Um, so I have this weird looking sketch here. If I go back to my rib feature then it's already saying that it wants to extrude this shape out parallel to the sketch. But that's not what we want. If I hit enter on this, it's already giving me some rebuild errors. It's saying, hey, we can't do that, man. There's It doesn't intersect with anything. So I want this to be par or perpendicular to my sketch, normal to the sketch, as opposed to uh, parallel to it. So now it's pointing towards the sketch plane, or towards the geometry rather, we can or we can see it's indicated by the error, arrow. Uh, I don't want to flip it or else it'll give me pretty much the same issue. It's saying, dude, it's just going to extend off into infinity, you, you can't do that. Um, so think about it like the arrow is kind of creating a boundary almost, or it's indicating where your boundary to this extrude should be. So right now, it should be pretty good. It's saying, hey, it's going to extrude it towards the geometry. Second I hit enter and it might do some issues. Okay, and I know the issue in that instance. The reason for that issue is because we see these little things right here where it's kind of extending a little bit off the edge. Um, usually that isn't too much of an issue. It can do that a little bit, but sometimes that can create some problems. 
So, and, and that's usually only going to be the case when it's kind of curved or rather at, a, at an angle like this where it could extend off of that face. So I'm just gonna reduce this by about half and this should maybe be a little bit nicer. Um, so now if I hit enter, cool. It creates this really funky looking rib. Um, and really, if I'm looking at this plane just completely normal, I can't even really tell um, that it extends outward other than it kind of being like a surface that we're given. Um, so we have something that looks like this now, but it extends until it hits the shape with a thickness of uh, five millimeters, two and a half both on both sides because of the direction that I indicated. If I wanted to go back and kind of play with things a little bit more, I could indicate just to, in this case, the left or just to the right, but I think this might give me some issues. Oh, I was wrong. Okay. So I think it just needed to be a bit thinner uh, because if I hit that, then it should work as well. I always like the mid plane one or this kind of both sides. So it extends two and a half on both the left and the right of the sketch. Does that kind of explain things at least a little bit more? Um, I know that the the one for the second in class assignment shouldn't be too crazy, um, since they're all just horizontal lines. Uh, I guess the important thing for that one is just how you're creating your datum plane. Um, and I, give me just one second, guys. I'll be right back. All right, sorry about the delay there, guys. Um, some other cool things that you can do with the uh, rib function. I know that it kind of showed up or it kind of shows it over here, but you can also draft these uh, these shapes. That gets a bit trickier because now you have something that's not only extruding, but it's, ex it's extruding on an angle or rather it's, an, it's extruding otherwise a strange curve that's at an angle, uh, which kind of makes things a little bit complex. It doesn't actually show it up here because it still starts with a thickness or an overall thickness of five. But if I give this a 10 degree draft, draft outwards and then hit okay, and then we go once again normal to this plane, we can definitely see that it widened as it went out. So there's really a whole lot that you can do with the rib, but some of it gets kind of complicated. So something like this is not what I would, this wouldn't be the first thing on my mind to give you guys as like an assignment or a homework or something like that, because this is already I wouldn't say this is complex enough, but kind of getting some of the aspects of the rib correct uh, are, are a little bit tricky, uh, just with some of the possible rebuild errors that you might get when you're trying to create your geometry. So that's why the in-class assignment and, and the homework, reasonably speaking, is somewhat simple in terms of uh, the geometry that uh, I gave you and the, the rib feature that is present in that geometry. I'm more curious about if I just like throw another line in here and if it will, it's probably gonna yell at me. There's no way that's not going to give me an error. The sketch cannot be used for a feature because an endpoint is wrongly shared by multiple entities. Hmm. Uh, I have no idea. Uh oh, yep, I broke it. <laughs>
Yeah, noted. It doesn't like intersection points of more than two lines. Or rather, yeah, more than two lines meeting. Noted. Pretty sure you can create stuff like this, though, where it might just have, like, say, like, a circle. Maybe that'll work? Yes, it does. Yeah, so stuff like that does work. figure out how to make them go diagonally. Gotcha. So, I would try to refer to refer you to two things. One thing kind of similar to what I just went through uh, on SolidWorks, which was it might be easier if you create a plane where you're looking you're basically looking in the direction of how you would extrude the shape, which you're extruding horizontal lines basically away from you. So, and I know that there are several ways that you can do it, uh, but I would probably be more inclined to create a plane that's basically starting at the two edges where it's basically connecting or, or creating a plane out of this like top edge and this top and this like bottom edge, I guess you could say, and then creating your uh, your rib sketches on that plane appropriately. Kind of, you kind of need to think about what your three dimensional shape is going to look like in some sense before you do it. Um, I would be less inclined to try to create your rib using this face just because I believe there's already a wall here or there's a plane there, which you could do it. You just have to do it on the inside of the plane and you'd have to be, you'd have to kind of change up how you're, how you're drawing it. Um, I'll maybe try to explain that a little bit better here in a sec. Um, to your question, so it has a, so that it has a height of 50, kind of like a length of 100, and like from front to back, it's about, it's 60. Um, so, is the rectangle shape? Yeah, so, so it, all of those shapes are, or all of those measurements are embedded within the within this shape. So uh, here, I have it open here. So basically this measurement here is 100. The height is 50. And I guess you could say like the depth is 60. Yeah, yeah, I, it might be worthwhile for me to possibly label what view you're looking at. Um, and that's kind of why I always, 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 always try to add this, uh, this detailed figure. Because that definitely, or at least most of the time, gives you a lot of information with regard to how this shape actually looks. Um, so you want to always kind of be, uh, I mean, if I'm, if I'm creating a part, um, I will usually look at one of the measurements, kind of look at something that, that looks like this, where it's kind of like a nice shape. I don't have weird edges like this, indicating that it's maybe tilted at some angle. Um, and then I'll say, okay, how can, I, how can I create a simple shape out of this first? Because like things like these lines up here are kind of bounding it, indicating that we do have walls here. It's just that this cross section is taking it right from the middle, saying, hey, we do have lines here or kind of walls here. It's just that they're 
they're not in this inner portion, they're only on the outsides, or on the outskirts. Um, should I have used further edges? Oh, I think I see what you're doing there. So rather than just creating a closed sketch, two things. One thing you're going to want to, if you're trying to use the rib feature, you typically want it to be just like an open, kind of like an open sketch. So when I say an open sketch, I mean, you don't have two curves that end up meeting, creating something that's closed. Kind of like when you have a closed shape, you can see that the inside of it is like shaded in blue. Um, by and large, at least mostly when I'm doing, um, when I'm using the rib, I'll just create, say a line or several lines that connect in some manner or ones that don't connect, but they're all in the same sketch plane. And then, then you can kind of rib from there. The one thing that you also want to keep in mind, though, for yours is that I'm only seeing one shape there. I'm kind of struggling to see what kind of those like two other yellow shapes represent. So I guess kind of what I'm saying is I would probably be more inclined to create three lines that you can just rib towards your shape on that sketch plane. So on that plane that you created, that datum plane. And then this this view here, this section HH view should kind of give you at least a little bit more info with regard to kind of how those things are detailed. Um, or rather how it should look. So yet again, you're not going to be able to smart dimension that stuff, but if you just kind of click on faces and then check to see what the distance between them is, um, or like rather the thickness, it, it should give you a bit more information. Hopefully that kind of explains it. Or it'll, or it will yell at me. We shall see. Yup. <laughs> Ascension of the rib does not intersect the part of the model. Oh, I see. So this would be kind of like an instance to be aware of. So like, even though from what I'm seeing on my sketch plane, it, it looks fine. Uh, but if I go to the rib menu and kind of look at what's happening, we can actually see like on both sides, that this actually extends a little bit off, which means even though this part right here is technically bounded, this bottom like triangle, right triangle, this part right over here is not. So I would probably want to move this over at least a little bit more, such that I don't get an issue like that, giving it some sort of distance there. Um, okay, thank God it didn't yell again. So I would probably be inclined to just delete both of these. I know it's upset. That's okay. 
and just say maybe this is going to be right there. Just that distance. Let's just say that this is like 50. And I'll do kind of something similar. Oh, not right there. Let's say that this is also 50. This th should theoretically work. Yeah. Neat. Yeah, a rib can be a little bit finicky sometimes. Uh, you mostly just want to make sure that whatever the extrusion that you're making is from that sketch is not going to go off the edge that doesn't contain some part of your geometry in the normal direction. Um, or else it's going to give you an error and say, can't do that. Hey, Ethan. What's up? My this first in class assignment, my mass values are way off, even though I feel really confident that all and kind of double checking my measurements that they're all good. Mm -hmm. I just I don't know if there's something I'm missing. If you could maybe take a look at it or an idea. Yeah, sure. What's going on? Uh, send a screenshot of it. Okay. I don't know the best one to send to you. Can I share my screen with you? Yeah, you might be able to. Hopefully it doesn't start yelling at us. Cool. Yes, I see it. Okay. So I don't know. Best way to look at it. I verified my heights. Mm -hmm. Um... Here, other side. I got this cross section. Yeah, so it's looking good. Uh, click on some of the inside radius values, like near the top, just so we can kind of verify to see if those are good. Like I said, if if other people are getting strange measurements as well for their mass. Then we can yeah, and I'm to... and I'm set to the right. At least I'm pretty sure I'm set to the right thing. So you just click on the face, right? Yeah, you should be able to just click on the face, and it should say it near the the bottom corner. Oh, okay. Let me do that. Yeah, right there. Uh... Yeah, mine doesn't say it. Mine, I've got some issue with my program. I gotta figure out. But Sometimes it gives me stuff. Bit... On funky but it, See, it does like say it right on, on the side there 0.2 radius or 0.25 radius yeah that's for the, this mm -hmm. yeah it's that's not something else okay um what uh what yeah. mass value are you getting like seven interesting what? where was i gonna evaluate that's it mass properties yeah, 7.02. And I got mine to be 6.43 pounds. Yeah, and usually I'm within, Pretty good you know, a couple area. hundredths. Yeah, Let me a open couple hundredths. Let back up and maybe see what's going on. Let me 
um, class four. 201 annealed stainless steel. Yeah, 201 annealed stainless steel, SS, so evaluate mass properties. 6.43 pounds, yeah. Let's see. There's my first sketch. I just did a boss extrude on a circle to make a cylinder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you and did then, pretty similar. Yeah, and then I did the next sketch, which is this one, a diameter of two on top of that. Mm -hmm. And then this is my first fillet was on the bottom. And then what is your... At point Just go one. into go into the uh, shell menu real quick. Shell, 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 shell. So it should be in the bottom if you just kind of right click on your the shell that you already made, yeah. And then edit feature. Oh. So so yeah, uh, so right click on uh, shell one. Yeah. And then it should be one of the options. I don't know if it's showing up for you, but if you, here, I'll kind of show you. If you're looking at mine, if you yeah. right click on it and then hit edit feature. Oh, that one up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're yeah. right. I remember that now. Yep. Um, and do that for, so that's your shell. It's point two. That's what yep, and I went inward. Yeah. I went inward because I did the, yeah, you gave the outside my first sketch was outside, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That is so, quite odd. Because, like, this is my first fillet. Mm -hmm. See, so I got point one, yeah, which is what it should be down there. Uh, that next one and up I did... top should be 0.25. Technically, the, the following two should be 0.25. And the one at the very top should be 0.1. Yep, so that one's good. Now, you guys were talking about order of operations and everything. Mm -hmm. but And it still works out fine for that. Yeah, Occasionally, it there. will... That is odd. And then this one, point one, yet again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, because I go right here. That was weird. But see, I've got the square on the inside, right? Yeah. Which is kind of what we wanted. Because I did the I did the fillets before I did the shell. Like the shell was the last thing I did. Yeah. Even then, that's that's interesting because even with mine, sometimes those features. I I think what it actually does is that occasionally when you have a uh, a radius of curvature that might be smaller um, than the thickness that you're assigning, sometimes it just won't do that that fillet. Um, on like the inside so because yeah. both this one on the very bottom and on the top didn't have uh, a radius or it, it had a radius of curvature that was smaller um, it just assigned it uh, as just kind of being flat like a flat edge um, I am curious as to why you're getting a value that's higher than that Um, yeah, because yours looks almost exactly like mine, like mm -hmm. same order, everything. That is because yeah, I just odd. did, I just did two extru extrudes, and the fillets, and then I did the shell. So
I mean, does that give you a radius when you do the measurement that way? It should give me one. I think if I click on this edge, yeah, it does. It gives me 0.45 for this edge. And if I click on this one, it gives me 0.05 as the radius value. Perfect. Yeah, for some reason my stuff is... Are you still in the measurement tool, though? Um, you don't necessarily have to be. Uh, it sometimes will... Um, I think the... Mm, it doesn't show up. I gotta figure out what this problem is. It says my graphics performance. It, it does that sometimes. It, it can be a bit of a pain uh, if you're either running other stuff or if it doesn't have enough uh, RAM. Granted, SolidWorks soaks up RAM, so it's, <laughs> it's kind of to be expected. Um, let me see your second extrude. So click on the boss extrude two and, and look in the features menu of that. So go to the edit feature. I just want to see that sketch. Yeah, that's 1.5. And then the other one should be nine. Yeah. Is, is it nine or ten? That might be it. Hold on. It should be nine. But oh, you're right. It is nine. That's probably it. I think I said. I might have said it to ten. Let me see. Yeah. Double check that. Cause Thought I, I double. I mean, if if that ain't it, then <laughs> I I have no idea. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it's at 10. Okay, hold. F Fingers crossed. No. 6.43. Nice. Perfect. Is that closer? That's exactly what it should be. Okay. Yep, that's what it was. Okay. Sometimes we just need somebody else to help go through it. <laughs> I don't know why I kept thinking 10. Where did I get 10 from? I don't know where I got 10 from. Well, it defaults to 10. So, I mean, it makes sense that numbers are close. Might just kind of roll right off. Just because this is kind of a... It goes from 9 to a 1.5. So it's pretty darn close to 10 already. Um, other than yeah. this extra little extrusion on the top if you do it in that way. I don't know, that's weird. Okay, but cool. Thank you. I will get this thing saved and submit it. For sure. And stop sharing my screen. <laughs> yeah, man, you're giving everybody the answers. I know, right? Uh, but yeah, that that is cool, though, to, to anybody that might have been seeing either me stream or uh, Bart stream there is that like there's there's all sorts of different ways that you can even do this model as well so I know that a couple people were doing kind of the revolve which is a perfectly acceptable way of doing it and I mean kind of as, as a little hint what I did was I just made two stacked cylinders and I added a, a few more fillets after that um, so there's all sorts of different ways that you can create your geometries. Many, many ways.
interesting. Thank you. 